Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Friday. Good morning, everyone. Welcome if you're listening on podcast. I'll say welcome again in case there's a delay, which there often is. Um, good morning, everyone. How are we? It's Friday. It's, 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 it's Friday, which usually means we're going to have no fun. How are we? Good morning, Margaret O'Brien. If you're listening on podcast, the names that we trot out are our dear, dear contributors, uh, followers, subscribers, family guests in the live chat. And here you all are, Jan Campbell, Lynn Sheard, Rachel Greenwood, Cloder, Erin Bullimore. Good morning. It, it's just, it's a, it's a wee, wee family. It's not a weeing family. That would be messy and a bit wet. It's a wee family. I love that. Wee bairn. I love that. I love we, as in small, not we, as in urinate. Just thought I'd clarify, you know, because I can. Because to say things like urinate when Nadia's not here is like a liberation. Um, Nadia's obviously up, 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 doing loose today. It's a big cinema day today, if anyone is a movie fan. It's Barbenheimer. So Barbie is released today. Oppenheimer is released today. Obviously, the, uh, the guy who the astrophysicist or nuclear physicist, atomic physicist, uh, instrumental in creating the atomic bomb. Um, Killian Murphy. We're going to talk about Killian Murphy uh, later and his remarkable diet uh, that he indulged in. I mean, I hope he, I hope he, I hope he didn't overdo it. Clearly, he didn't. Um, and 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 we're going to explore the way in which certain actors have gone perhaps beyond the call of duty uh, for their craft. And some would argue, I know Nadia would, uh, certainly around the case of Matthew McConaughey. Perhaps they've never quite returned. Um, Zoe Eleanor, the interview I had on Wednesday to train as a, ooh, where have you gone? A counsellor, I got an unconditional offer. Can everyone give Zoe Eleanor a huge round of applause? Teresa Hutchison, I'm doing some Tunisian crochet. Learned the simple stitch last night in making a little zipped up patch. What the hell is Tunisian crochet? I mean, presumably it's crochet from Tunisia. I mean, I'm not an absolute Burke. I'm a bit of a Burke. Morning, Tim from Perth in Scotland. Hope you're well, Tim, sending you one day at a time recovery vibes. Um, Sophia Lopez, I'm going in port to Portugal to watch after your review. You're, I'm going in Portugal to watch after your review, Mark. Yes, yeah, so our Barbie review is up. It says it's a spoiler review. There aren't massive spoilers to be had. There's a moment at the end of the film that perhaps you would rather just respond to yourself. So, but we do flag it up in the review. Um, I'm going to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers tonight in Tottenham. Um, I was speaking to someone else. I did about six Zoom meetings last night. I was talking to an actor last night. He's off to see the Red Hot Chili Were the Red Hot Chili Peppers the ones that, correct me if I'm wrong, were they the ones that got onto stage in the 80s and put socks on their penises? Am I, am I totally imagining that? Or was that the Beastie Boys? Was that? Yeah, Tim, just... It's just good in it, a day at a time. Sometimes if you, when you just, just a little bit of recovery chat for Tim, when you just keep it to a day, a day at a time, almost the pressure comes off you, doesn't it? Morning, Lee, Lee, my mate, my mate, Marmite. No, you're not Marmite. Um, Jude Osler, glad she hasn't given up on me. Um, watched the review yesterday, loved it, Rachel Greenwood. Thank you very much, yeah. Uh, hi, Debbie Pollard, welcome. Um, Oh, look, The Telegraph has just dropped a headline saying, new Labour MP, we're going to talk briefly about that, who's 25, uh, likened to the in-betweeners. Um, so there we go. Uh, spent some lovely time with uh, Lee Durham. Well, we're, we're hopefully going to grab a coffee soon. Uh, spent some lovely time with Lee Peart yesterday. Lee, just, you just... I hope your cheeks are still flushed from the, uh, from the uh, well, just the glory and the, and the, and the love and the massaging, I mean, it was quite erotic, actually, the whole thing, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> morning, HW, morning, Ellery Jones. So, of course, yes, yeah, so Barbie, and, and Oppenheimer is released today, too. So, obviously, we're going to talk about, we'll talk about the actors and everything uh, down there. Now, in terms of news, boring, boring, boring news. Three by-elections, Rishi Sunak, you know, we've made no sort of, you know, we don't hide the fact that we lean towards the left, but that doesn't mean we have an unconditional adoration of Keir Starmer, far from it. Um, but uh, Rishi Sunak lost two by-elections, but, what do you, and for any of politicos here, and we'll, we'll push past this quite quickly, uh, Lynn Aoki, Barbie, who actually goes to watch that? Mm, well, it might not be what you think it is. I think I think a lot of people are, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a bit, Lynn. Um, so double by-election blow for Sunak, but... 
But the seat that Boris Johnson used to hold, uh, which should have gone to Labour, um, was won, was held rather, by the Tories. What, what, what do we make of that? What do we make of that? Sir Keir. That's, yes, absolutely. Thanks, good job, Lollipop. Let's be, keep our manners. Sir Keir, or Brigadier, Brigadier Sir Keir. One of the, uh, one of the Labour winners, though, is uh, a chap called Keir Mather, is it Mather, 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 Mather. Um, only held by 400 votes, Lynn Eric. Good point, but still held. It's quite something, isn't it? But the by-election, when we have a 25-year-old Labour politician, and I think, you know, lots of chat, as it generally does, a little bit predictably, but hey, let's be predictable. It's Friday, and we're not having any fucking fun. This, ain't, this, this is a hashtag Friday fun-free zone. Hashtag fun-free Friday zone. Um, is he, here's a question. Is he too young at 25 to be able to govern as a politician? Just give us it straight. Give us it between the eyes, guys. Come on. Is he too young? We talk a lot about the fact that the young are disenfranchised. They, they don't sort of seem as politically motivated. Then obviously there are lots of youngsters who say, yes, we are. Um, is this a good thing? Is it important that youngsters see young people in government? Uh, Russ Satch, I guess if there's no confidence in the opposition, then maybe best to keep the Tories in power. Gulp, did I just say that? Oh, Russ. I did hear someone rang the radio, the, uh, someone rang up today, really spitting feathers, kind of, kind of understandably. Um, yeah, he has been labelled an in-between, a good chip lollipop, uh, saying, you know, we really don't have much choice politically, do we? Um, no fresh ideas, says Michelle Hofstein. May, yes, maybe a young person will be some fresh ideas and positivity, says Tracy Street. I think this is the thing. If we accept that being a politician isn't just about you being a politician, um, it's important to have representation, right? And as, as important as it is to have gender, transgender, all ethnicities, all diversities, I think all ages. Yeah, balances out all the old folks, says Louise N. So I think good on him. We, what's the light? I mean, I don't know too many people called Keir. What's the likelihood? Who thinks he'll be leader? Who thinks we'll watch footage of him like we did of that sort of precocious William Hague years ago? And there we are, you know, here he was, he was made to his baby in the house. And now he's the president of the Isle of Wight or whatever will end up happening. I think youth House of Commons should vote on legislation too. And the result of both should be the outcome. I'm just going to down my first coffee of the day. Boom, just in case I run out of rocket fuel, I have my Barocca. Oh, and, and just in case I run out of rocket fuel, caffeine free. Was it called decaf? Oh, what's it called? Uncaf? What's it called? Is it caffeine free? No, what's it called? Decaf, that's it. Curly cooks tomorrow. You have got a, you're gonna be kicked in the guts tomorrow. You're gonna be, it's a gut punch tomorrow. That it seeds, nuts, and all sorts of pulses. I'm going to be kicking off big time tomorrow if it's too mung bean healthy. Sounds like, from what I'm hearing, what I was hearing on the grapevine, sounds like it's going to be a lot of mung bean shit going on tomorrow. And that, that's not me saying don't watch it. I'm saying watch it, but flipping hell, there better be some fucking sugar in there somewhere, mate. Um, anyway, so yeah, so the by-elections, it's all big news. Everyone's talking about, you know, is this the end? But I, I, you know, again, the Tories have got something there that they can work with, so, so that's good. Um, Rolex robbers. This is the story of, uh, well, let me, let me, uh, um, poor old Alid Jones. Uh, I don't know if you know Alid Jones. For any of our foreign um, or, or, you know, American international Watchers, uh, Ali Jones is a TV presenter. He was infam He was made infamous or famous for singing, I'm walking through the air. I'm flying through a terrible storm. I feel like I've got hair. I think we all thought, even when I was 10, I think I'm the same age as Ella Jones, what's he going to do when his voice breaks and his balls drop? What's going to happen? We all thought it. Even I thought it at the age of 10. What's he going to do when he coughs and he goes... Rrr, rrr. But he still sings. Anyway, poor old Ali Jones. He's, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a laugh. He's a laugh. He's been held at Machete 
point, quite literally, machete point, um, uh, as he was robbed and uh, uh, the, the Rolex Rippers, as they're being called in London, uh, took his Rolex watch off him. He was with his son, I believe. I mean, imagine that. Imagine, I mean, I've had a gun pointed at me in the car in South East London, um, and that was very frightening. Though, even though it was a gun, and even though there was an aspect of, oh my God, life has just gone so into slow motion, there was also a sense that he's not going to use it. It just doesn't happen, and it probably isn't loaded, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, this sort of stuff happens. Have I had a knife held up? No, I've been stabbed. I've seen a guy getting off a, I've talked about it before, just locally, I saw a guy get off a bus, and when he jumped off the bus quickly, a machete skittled onto the floor. It made that clattering sound, turn around, and, and, and there you are. Um, and wow, you know, and it, it's a curious fact, isn't it, Meetube? You know that in a weird way, certainly in this, if a gun is pulled, it's, it's very unlikely that it's gonna be fired, and very unlikely that they've actually got bullets. I mean, this, can you believe one thinks like this? But to have had a machete pulled on him is deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, and there are more and more stories of this happening, certainly around areas like Kensington, Knightsbridge. Um, and there's the suggestion that, um, you know, a lot of uh, wealthy individuals wearing Rolexes, tag heroes, all this kind of stuff are being monitored and followed for a considerable amount of time prior to it. Because, of course, some of these watches are worth, uh, I, I think, £17,000 was the one that, um, that Alan Jones was wearing. Um, uh, but there's a group of six, the Rolex Rippers, who are now uh, facing jail sentence uh, after going on an 18-day crime spree. Uh, they punched one guy in the face and two other men were targeted outside a pub for their individually. Each of them had a £35,000 watch. Now, of course, all of this is in, uh, who are we talking about? Ali Jones, a uh, TV presenter, singer. Um, he's quite famous. He's sort of, he's sort of kind of fondly loved in, in, in the UK. Um, Songs of Praise is a religious sort of choir-like show. I don't, I, I don't know, is Songs of Praise still on? Um, so he was robbed in Chiswick. And so they, there's a lot of these things going on. And of course, this is entirely reprehensible. It's wrong and everything. And I was, just, I was reading about this story and we are, I asked about this on Coffee Moaning's uh, Instagram account, account. It's not about, of course, you should be able to do and wear and have, you know, none of this should have happened. And this sh we shouldn't live in a world where this kind of lawlessness kind of happens. But let me just give you a parallel. It's not that kids shouldn't, you know, when you see kids go out and you say, you're going to, you're going to be all right. You're going to be in pairs. You're going to, you know, you, you remember saying to my oldest years and years ago, make sure you walk home with someone. And, and quite rightly, she was like, yeah, but I'm a woman. I want to be able to walk home on my own. And I'm like, look, I absolutely get that. Of course, you should want to be able to do that. You should be able to do that. There's ideals and then there's reality ideals and reality and it just this just led me to thinking especially in a world now where the haves and haves not seems it seems so much more starker than ever is it now are we past the point where it's actually right or sensible to wear something that is so expensive when you're let's say out in the real world i mean okay you know like parties uh, red carpet events, celebrity events, fine. You're going to wear bling and flashy stuff because you're going to be around lots of other flashy stuff and all that kind of stuff. But do you, do you, what do you think? Do you think there is something in this whilst it shouldn't happen? Is it one of those situations where we go, well, you should be able to wear your £35,000 Rolex watch? But I wouldn't because this kind of thing could happen. What do you think? Um... Really uh, don't wish anyone any harm and H, but it's hard to understand people who wear such expensive accessories uh, when there is so much poverty in the world. I mean, I, sometimes when I was younger, it's funny, I mean, I, I don't want to, I always remember one of my girls saying many years ago, oh, look, that's, that, that, that's the kind of man, oh, hang on, are we a bit blurry? Let me just check. Let me just check them on the right uh, Wi-Fi, just one sec. Uh, that, that should be good. That should be better. It should be more consistent. Um, I always thought, was it, I, I, I seem to remember, Mum, I think the guy you kind of originally came to London with, um, I think he, he wore quite flashy kind of jewellery and stuff like that. I always remember finding, I always, I remember finding it a little bit tasteless 
I don't know, big chunky watches. I, I find them a little bit tasteless. Um, that's not to say for a minute that they, you know, anyone deserves to be, I'm not saying that at all, but is there some aspect of you're kind of courting some kind of possible issue? I've also also always really wondered what, what the wearer of a Rolex is trying to say. No excuse for crime whatsoever. This isn't, that's not what I'm saying. It's like there's no excuse for sexual harassment, but it's like taking precautionary measures is, is sensible. And I, and I do worry that in certain, you know, again, it comes down to where are you doing it, what certain areas, certain parts of the world. Wow, look at that magpie. There's a magpie literally just about to come through the door. So I'm, if, if I suddenly, just wait one minute. Wow, yeah, proper squaring up, man. Um, Daisy Hayes, my husband wears his Casio over his tag here now, more for practical reasons, but we've visited some super poor countries, so I'm glad he sticks with the Casio. I mean, I have nice watches, but I stick to my Fitbit. I've been mugged on holiday once, Joni Nitch Nikki, uh, once in Tenerife. It was terrifying. Do you know what I mean? Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? I, I know it's easy to kind of go, oh, you're, you're, no one's justifying any kind of crime. That's a ludicrous lunacy, of course not. But in a real world, in a pragmatic situation, should you? Should you just sort of say to yourself, do you know what, actually, this is, this is for, what do they call it? This is for special? This is for, what does an adjective call it when she wears something and goes, this is for something or other, I don't know. Decaf, maybe, I don't know. Um, they're so cheeky, aren't they, magpies? But these are the Rolex Rippers, inside the Rolex Rippers. Okay, I'm gonna ask you now, what creepy crawly gives you the <gasps> There was a wasp yesterday and it was buzzing around Lee Peart's head and everyone dashed for cover. And I said, it's one of those wasps that doesn't sting. And someone said it does, and then, and then, and then a bedlam broke out. Slugs, Bonnie Delaney. Wow, earwigs, really? Who's that? Kirsty, Kirsty Rowley, Rowley, Rowley says, earwigs. Wasp, Tina, uh, Wendy Stewart, Tina Davis, spiders, um, slugs. That's an interesting one. I know what you mean, Rachel Greenwood. I remember when I was climbing Mont Blanc, coming out of some hut at some base camp somewhere or other. And you wear your precious items for best. That's it, for best, thank you. Who said that? Um, I remember stepping out, this isn't a slug, but it's why I can, un I can kind of understand, Jane Bentley, thank you. This is why I can understand um, the slug thing. And I, mean, I stepped on something so squelchy, it went between my toes. It wasn't nice. And it was a toad. Not, not, it didn't look good after I'd stepped on it with my flat feet. I had nothing, I was like literally stumbling around in the dark to go for a week. Bonnie Delaney says hornets. Me too, you've not heard that phrase. For best, save it for best. I don't know why I'm saying it like that, save it for best. <laughs> um, mosquitoes, Elizabeth Gordon. I hate cockroaches. I remember traveling around Bali and uh, Lombok years and years ago. Oh my Christ, the cockroaches. Oh my God. I mean, it's the skittle sound, the scuttle, skittle, scuttle sound that they make is just, uh, someone said flying ants there. Did he, on that flying ants story, who said flying ants? Uh, da, da, da. Butterfly is the country pumpkin. That's interesting. Um, oh, flying ants, Joe McKenna. Did you see that, Joe McKenna, you'll hate this. Over Kent, I think two or three weeks ago, there was a, a mile long cloud of flying ants. Imagine that. I mean, they don't hurt, but they're, do you remember it always used to be like one day a year? They'd all come out and they'd be giddy and drunk. They'd flop about. Almost like they were going like, what the fuck's going on? Hang, hang, hang on a minute, Pete, I've just woken up with wings. What do you do with these things? And then they'd land on the floor. And as kids, as boys, you'd, you'd kill them all, wouldn't you? But do you remember that? Suddenly one day they'd all be like, what the hell's happened? I've just, I've just grown wings. Most bugs, someone said there. Who's, who, um, who said I love flinging slugs around? Did someone just say I, I used to be? I won't say what I used to do when I was younger. It was terrible. The snails, terrible. Uh, Lin Aoki, my Japanese hubby is allergic to moths. Was interesting when we encountered one in the elevator in Japan. I was peeing myself. Was he in a panic? I used to hate worms, MT2. Now I like them. Uh, really don't. Okay, well, this is Asian hornets. Why, why am I asking you? Asian hornets that can kill in minutes. I don't want to scare you. I'm scared. They're big. 
I mean, they'd be, I was stung by a hornet in Ibiza when I was uh, 18, 19. Whole hand came up. It's like just enormous. Anyway, Asian hornets. We've talked about this each year. Global warming. More and more of them are being found in Kent. Uh, and more queens than ever have been found in Jersey because, of course, Jersey is en route from France. And in fact, there are claims that up to five people in France have died due to, is it anaphylactic shock uh, from a, 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 an Asian hornet sting? Um, you know, presumably the bigger the hornet, the bigger the sting, the bigger the sting, the bigger the bite, the bigger the bite, the bigger the shock, the bigger the... I can't stop, stop me. Do, do you know what I mean? Um... Oh, look at that. Joe McKenna saw on Instagram that hanging a bag of water on your garden door stops flies coming in your house, apparently. Really? I like that. Okay, so Jersey currently at the moment has... Oh, ticks. Jan Campbell, ticks. We had to... Poor old Toffee had a tick not that long ago. Um, Jersey's current total is 476 queens. Not that kind of queen, Lee. Um, 476 queens this year... Um, in Jersey, which is six times uh, the amount last year. And they're beginning to land in Kent. But Jersey Islanders have got a curious weapon in their fight against the killer Asian hornets. And do you know what they are? Do you know what that, what they are? Do you know what that weapon is? Do you know what that weapon is? I'll give you a clue. See if you can guess. Can you, can you guess what that weapon is? Water guns, says Elizabeth Gordon. Oh, wouldn't that just aggravate them? Oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, be like, wouldn't it be like poking a hornet's nest? Me tuber Dyson, nearly. Henry Hoovers. They're using Henry Hoovers, I kid you not. Now, okay, so let's imagine the scene. I'm a Jerseyan, so probably quite chilled and smug because I'm neither French nor English, but sunny. Maybe talk with a bit of a French accent, and I've got my Henry Hoover. I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get that hooded, my darling. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> right, you've got your hornet in your Henry Hoover. You look down at Henry Hoover's face, and rather than doing that, he's doing that. What do you do then? There's a fucking Asian hornet in your fucking Henry Hoover. How'd you get it out? That hornet is gonna. It, it, I reckon it'll eat. You're never going to be able to empty the Henry Hoover, are you? Plus, I feel sorry for Henry. What's he ever done wrong? But anyway, yeah. yeah so I've just got visions of people. Anyone here from the uh, from the Jersey, from Jer Jersey? The, what are they called the uh, what are they called the what are they called those islands? The Jersey Islands. No, what are they called? Channel Islands. Flipping hell. Decaf. Um, I've just got visions of everyone on the on on the Ch Channel Islands with Henry Hoovers. Henry goes out in the garden then. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, but a buzzing Henry who... Oh, dear, I don't know. But th th these are big and these are worrying. And if you see one of these, I'm looking at a photograph of one now. Go to my, the Coffee Moaning Instagram account. Check out the stories. You'll see one on her hand. They are like... It's like a sort of Pixar... It's like an animated drawn version of the Optimum Wasp. It's not looking for... It looks like it's got a yellow helmet on as well. Flipping it. Okay, school's out for summer. School's out for summer. And kids are going to get bored. Who's worried about keeping their kids stimulated here? Are you? Have you got a bunch of kids that you're going to be looking after and thinking, what the hell am I going to do with them? <sighs> Can't give them the crack pipe to smoke. Can't give them a bag of razor blades or anything like that. That would be terrible. What are you going to do? I'm being obviously being very silly. I was, I was reminded, one of the things, I'm going to run through a list of things that some people are suggesting you can do with your kids this summer. You don't have any, even if you don't, yeah, you don't have kids, Hillary. Uh, result. Um, some of those funny little things that you, you used to do as a kid. I remember my granddad giving me a, um, uh, uh, what are they called, matchbox. And him saying to me, I'll give you a penny for every single thing you can fit into this matchbox. Which, if you think about it, was an incredibly clever thing to do. Because I spent absolutely ages trying to find... And, and he said they all have to be... You can only have one of each thing. So he said, you can't go and put loads of sand in and then expect me to count the sand granules. And I 
was like, okay. So I'd go around and I'd find a little leaf and I'd find a little pebble and I don't know, I'd find a pip and I'd find a twig, all this kind of stuff. I'd become obsessed. Simple pleasures. What did you used to do? What do you get your kids to do? Good job, Lollipop, what are you saying there? Let's have a look. Uh, we had a thing at school where we had to fit as many different things in a matchbox. That's weird, there's an echo. So did we, it was fun. Um, Ju Oslo, I used to be obsessed with bouncy balls. I presume you mean of the sort of tennis variety. Ball games, let's call it ball games. Ball games. I mean, when you've got nothing else, you have to get inventive with your balls. Don't you? I mean, you've got to, you know, be... I mean, I always remember being absolutely fascinated. This was at school, but I'd be fascinated around the streets when you'd see girls would play that. Do they still do it? They'd play that game against a wall with the balls. And they'd be... It would be this kind of mystic mantra that was going on. And I'd, I'd like, walk past, like, you know, snot and sweat going... And I'd just look at them. And the girls would be like... Vicky Peveril should be doing this. And it began so fast against the wall. I'd be like, what is the what are the mystic arts of this ball game against a wall? What was it? Pat ball, is that what it was? One potato, two potato. It was like those things that you used to do with the string, and you'd kind of and I'd be like, I never had the patience to work that stuff out. Pixie petal. Jenny, kids need to be bored sometimes and find things to do. You're absolutely all right. You're absolutely right. My kids are now grown up and I loved school holidays. A day or two out each week, played games at home and met up with friends. The only way you could ensure a child is bored now, unfortunately, is if you kidnap them, take them hostage and lock them in the bathroom with no tech. It's the only way you can generate boredom. And I think you're right. I think generating boredom is crucial. They've got either a phone or there's another telly or there's something, you know, there's all this game or French skipping. Yeah, there used to be really elaborate reversions of um, hopscotch. I'd, I'd go, oh, there's hopscotch. And then suddenly there'd be, girls would be, it was always girls dancing around it on the outside on the line. I'd be like, oh, I don't get it. French cricket, Joe McKenna. And I used to create, I mean, I think I've said before, I used to, I used to play Sabutio on my own. That was, that, that was good. Um, so, yeah, so what are some of the things you can do with your kids this summer? What are they saying here? Let's have a look. How to entertain your kids. Uh, put up a tent in the garden if you've got one. Or put up a tent in the park. And if someone comes along and says you can't live here, or camp here, say, I'm not I'm entertaining my kids. Make an I'm bored jar. Get the kids to fill an old jar with little folded notes that have ideas for things they can do. But that's a bit stupid. This is the son that's saying this. If the kids don't know what to do, how are they going to know what to write on the note to put in it? You need to create them. Creating a den, kids love that. And all that needs is two bits of furniture, two chairs, a blanket, chuck it over the top, but always remember to weigh it down on the far right or the far left or on both sides, because otherwise your break, which could be an opportunity to have some Prosecco or a coffee, if you're me, will forever be interrupted by them saying, Dad, it's fallen down. Dad, it's fallen down. Dad, could you put it back up? Treasure hunt. That's good. I like a treasure hunt. Camp in the garden. I've said that. Up and over, create an obstacle course. I used to do this a lot, actually. Create an obstacle course around the house and then say you've got to do it in a certain amount of time. Get them to create the obstacle course. Just make sure they don't use anything precious. Film night. Well, of course, we used to do film night. Turn your room into a fully-fledged cinema. Nadia was good at this. She'd make popcorn, you know, proper make the popcorn. Take, keep the lid off the popcorn. And the shrapnel hurts kids. It's great. Nothing like popcorn injury. Um, hold a bake-off. Nadia was always good with that. Also, washing up can be fun. I don't know about washing up. Shit. Clean the car. If you've got a car, get them to wash the car. It's always fun. Because suddenly an adult saying you can fire this O's at whoever you want. Make sure you get mum at the same time. Um, digging. If you've got a part of the garden that you need turning over and you just can't be arsed, say to, say to Johnny, who's a little bit obsessive with his spade and wanting to destroy things, Dig that up now, come on. And then, and then, and then turn your back. Roll, roll a fat one and you're away. Indoor den, life-size art. Get a roll of graffiti. 
Kids like the idea that rules are being broken. So if you can, pre can pretend or create the idea that they're drawing or writing on something they shouldn't, but you know secretly it's okay because you're going to wash it down and wipe it down. That's good too. And then, of course, you know, these are things that don't cost too much either. Uh, MeTube, my friends and I used to explore the underground, just go to the end of the line and see what was there, MeTube. Maybe I met you. We once, well, this is a dark, dark story. Me and Edwin headed off one time on the central line, uh, far east to a place called Grange Hill. And we headed there, this was probably 1978 or seven. Quite young to be on the, on the trains. Um, and we headed there in pursuit of Grange Hill, the school. Got out of the station, said to the ticket guy, said, oh, and then he said, what are you doing here? Because we look young and weird. And we, tickets were little yellow ones. And I said, we're looking for the school. And I remember, I'll never forget him going, <laughs> you fucking idiots, there isn't one. The reason this story gets dark was we then got on a train that was heading to Epping Forest and a man and a woman with dogs and a bag, an enormous bag of chocolate started to invite us into the woods and did invite us into the woods. And we went with them and we ate chocolate and we went further into the woods and eventually, even though Edwin said he wanted more chocolate, I screamed, this isn't safe. We need to get out of here. And we turned and ran. One of those sliding doors moment, guys. Just shows you how a really nice, sweet, reflective story turned dark. Now, to be fair to my mum, she didn't really know where I was or what I was doing ever, really, did you, mum? That night, I think it was pretty obvious that at the time that I arrived back, which was dark and it was late, and this was the 70s, so don't judge her for this. She slapped me so hard because she was so cross and so scared. I remember thinking, God, a slap or a bag of chocolate, which was better? It was a funny time, Mum, wasn't it, the 70s? We used to also, just going back to that, going around on the tube, don't do this, kids. We used to, tube doors never really shut properly, and they didn't have the automatic thing that if you put your head there, they'd open. So we would travel between stations with our finger in the train doors, and we'd all look through the window and, and see how near, of course, they're tiny little infant fingers, and we'd try and see how near to the kind of electric wall our fingers would get. Then my friend Perry said, let's do our head. Unfortunately, they did have a, situ a system where obviously the drivers looked down and could see if, your, if a, a boy's blonde head was stuck out the door. I mean, the stupid things we do. Okay, finally, let's talk about, I did have a story about Marilyn Manson, who's gonna plead no contest to blowing his nose on a photographer. He, bl he literally blew his nose on a photographer. I mean, Marilyn Manson, the singer. Um, and there's also a story here about a woman who spends two grand a year eating toilet roll. Uh, and I thought, mum, match made in heaven. I mean, you know, you might not eat it, but you may as well do. We're getting to the quiz. Barbenheimer is coming, two biggest, it, it, you know, it's nice this for film fans. Finally, a sort of day where everyone's thinking about potentially film and cinema and, and then lots of people aren't. <laughs> um, but if you are, which are you going to see first, Barbie or Oppenheimer? Lots of people are uh, going to do the double bill experience at some point over the weekend. Our Barbie review is up. Oppenheimer will be landed tonight. Um, so the star of Oppenheimer, Killian Murphy, has taken dramatic measures to lose the amount of weight he needed to lose to play Oppenheimer. Um, and his diet, his diet, well, do you know what his diet is? It was an almond a day. An almond a day. An almond a day. And this put me in mind of the fact that, you know, I don't know if you remember Christian Bale, lost a frightening amount of weight to uh, perform, to play the role that he had in um, uh, The Machinist. Um, I can't, I don't believe that can be true. Emily Blunt said this and he said he went to extreme measures and he said he got competitive with himself. And I do worry about this sort of trend, uh, not trend, I mean, obviously there's not enough, there's not enough Hollywood actors doing this for it to become a trend. But when you see it, you know, and you hear it, you sort of think this can't be good for their psychology. Stephen Graham is a fabulous actor. He talked about not necessarily weight loss, but he talked about going full method for some of his roles. And you could argue, you know, going full method is kind of like, well, full method is immersion into, and in this instance, for Killian Murphy, it was partly method because the character of Oppenheimer apparently didn't eat very much at all, which is why he says, I think he smoked and drank martinis, that was it. Um, but yeah, so again, 
I mean, this is what they're saying in the junket interviews. He ate an arm and a day. He must have taken dramatic measures to lose as much weight as he has. But Nadia often says Matthew McConaughey never really returned, did he, from Dallas Buyers Club? Is that, is that the name? You know, where he played the, um, the guy who uh, died of AIDS or got AIDS. He's never, you could argue, he's never really uh, looked quite the same again. And I worry that, you know, Christian Bale with The Machinist, um, I saw photos of Simon Pegg having a lot, had a dramatic weight transformation. Um, but these kind of, and Christian Bale not only lost so much weight for The Machinist, but he put on an awful lot of weight for, um, was it Vice, where he played Dick Shaney? Um, what do you think? Do you think this is necessary? Do you think we would... Do you think we'd give these actors a pass if they didn't look quite... Tom Hanks in Philadelphia, absolutely. If they didn't look quite so skinny. I mean, let's have a look at some other actors. Uh, Adam Driver shed 50 pounds for his role in Silence. Uh, Anne Hathaway lost, well, 24 pounds. But, I mean, it's a lot for her part in Les Mis. Charlize Theron gained a lot of weight for her role in Tully uh, when she... Um, uh, Chris Pratt gained weight. Uh, and then got informed for Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Christian Bale obviously put on weight. Uh, Colin Farrell gained 20 kilograms for The Lobster. Uh, Hugh Jackman. Jake Gyllenhaal gained and shed a lot of weight for Southpaw. James McAvoy, too thin, and then and then built out an enormous body for um, Glass. Uh, Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix, the Joker, for Joker. I mean, he lost an enormous amount of weight. Uh, Jonah Hill. Wait, uh, should wait for, uh, for uh, Maniac, uh, Matt Damon. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's that thing, isn't it? And I, I sometimes worry that uh, Brendan Fraser did good in The Whale. Yeah, I mean, obviously there was a lot of CGI help there and a, and a fat suit, but De Niro, Rachel Ball, you know, is it necessary? I mean, Louisa N, Louisa N, absolutely. It was already quite thin. Me too, but I'm already on my third almond. Definitely not dangerous. It is dangerous, Charlie's Theron, Monster's Ball, yeah. I, I don't know. I, th I think we could... It's like sometimes people get really aerated, don't they? Like uh, Whack and Phoenix, his American accent with Napoleon. I think there are certain sort of, the sort of um, slates, sort of, what's it called, shorthands and kind of... We accept something. If he's going to talk with an American accent, we, we bed into that for Napoleon. Um, and I think we could do the same with weight loss and stuff like that. I, I sometimes wonder whether it's a... Certainly not with Killian Murphy because he's not that way inclined, but, you know, it... Does it sort of add a certain sort of... I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis went to great lengths, didn't he? Does it add a certain sort of gravitas to their craft maybe maybe it's what's necessary okay let's do it's quiz of the anyway uh, do check out our barbie review and as i say check out oppenheimer later it's um I, i'm very excited about that film okay let's it's quiz of the week so for those of you who are not into quizzes you may want to head off and start your hashtag fuck off fun friday go and have fun have fun but you may want to have fun with us in which case um Let's plow on. I just need to do a couple of things here just to get this screen up and then lose this over here. Um, quiz of the week, get your paper or get your, get your gin, get a gin and uh, I will be asking you questions in two ticks. Let's do this, I've got that. So question one, are we ready? Let's see if you can get, let's see if we can get to, I've had a look at the questions. I think you might be able to get I think you might be able to get five. I think five is a good is a good aim today. I think that's I think that's realistic. Let me just pull this up here so I can see all your comments. Okay, one out of seven. Here I come. Meet you. Question one: um, Hollywood screeched to a halt as members of the Screen Actors Guild uh, walked out in their dispute with the film studios. But what can actors still do without breaking the strike? So obviously actors uh, are now on strike. Uh, so what can, but what can they still do which doesn't break the strike? Can they do auditions? Can they do costume, costu costume? Where did my C go? Can they do costume fittings or can they do TV advertisements? A, B or C? A, auditions, B, costume fittings or C, ads, TV ads. Which of those can they still do? Don't forget at the Oppenheimer premiere, all the actors just walked out because the strike started. Just missed my mouth. <laughs> um, what have we got here? Uh, Julie Hilton saying, hey, okay, you're kind of tied between auditions and C adverts. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone for costume fittings. Seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Costume fittings, you, you'll change by the time the strike's over, especially if you're Killian Murphy eating almonds. 
Um, it's C, TV advertisements. So you can still do TV ads. So we're suddenly going to see lots and lots of very familiar faces all doing adverts. Question two. Tributes were paid to singer and actress Jane Birkin, who died 76, best known for her duet with French songwriter Serge Gainsbourg, Je T'aime. But what fashion item did she also inspire? Was it A, a dress, B, a handbag, or C, a hat? Both of these stories so far we covered in the <laughs> moaning this week. Is it A, B, or C? Is it A, a dress, B, a handbag, or C, a hat? And if you're fans of Real Housewives of anywhere, you'll know what the answer to this is. Oh yeah, vast majority of you getting that, vast majority of you, well done. Christos, I bet this was right on the tip of your tongue, wasn't it? I bet you've got one, haven't you, Christos? You've got a, a Merkin, no, not a Merkin, a Birkin. Very different. You don't want to be carrying a Merkin around. Question three, the FIFA's Women's World Cup kicked off in Australia and New Zealand, but which team's preparations for the tournament were disrupted by a pay dispute? This is one of the questions that could, could screw things for you. Was it A, Australia, B, South Africa, or C, the USA? Uh, Women's World Cup kicked off in Australia and New Zealand, but which team's prep for the tournament were disrupted by a pay dispute? Was it A, Australia? Was it B, South Africa? Or was it C, the United States of America? Come on, come on, baby, like my fire. Come on, baby, like my fire. What am I saying that? <laughs> um, it's B, South Africa. Question four. Archaeologists in Italy revealed a number of discoveries from the ancient city of Pompeii. Fascinating, isn't it, Pompeii? Including a picture of something that looks like pizza and a kitchen shrine adorned with serpents. But which of these was not among them? Which of these was not among them? A, a bed, B, a fountain, or C, a gold necklace. Archaeologists revealed a number of discoveries from Pompeii, including a picture of something that looks like a pizza and a kitchen shrine adorned with serpents. But which of these was not among them? So which of these did they not find? Was it A, a bed, B, a fountain, or C, a gold necklace? It's one of those odd double negatives. Uh, lots of you saying A, a bed. The answer is a gold necklace. Question five. Millions of US military emails have been mistakenly sent to Mali because of a minor typing error. Oh my God, the Pentagon admitted this week. But what was the domain name to which the messages were accidentally sent? So what was the end of the, you know, like you get .co.uk or .com. What was the end of the domain name that the Pentagon sent military emails to by mistake? Was it .mi, A, B, .ml, or C, dot M-I-L. Bearing in mind this is for Mali. So presumably, you know, dot whatever it is, is the, uh, is the domain name end for this, for the, uh, what have we got here? Elpmec, dot M-I-L. Is it A, dot M-I, B, dot M-L, or C, dot M-I-L? This is the other one that I thought you might struggle with. This is why I think five is an, five is an, amb is a, is a, is a, is a logical and rational ambition. At this point, I really do think five is your, your aim, guys. Don't judge yourself. I mean, I know, you know, look, if you fa it's winning. You want to win. It's about being a winner. And none, I don't think any of you are going to win today, I'm afraid. So, uh, Lots of you saying C, it's .mlb. Question six. Nigeria has been gripped by world record mania in recent weeks, following Chef Hilda Bachi's successful effort to cook for almost 100 hours uninterrupted. Wow. You should see in our kitchen sometimes at the weekend. We're, we're, we're tipping that point sometimes. But which of these records has not been attempted? A, continuous massaging. B, crying non-stop for seven days. Or C, the longest time reading aloud. Which of those hasn't happened? There was a, a well, yeah, there was a story this week of someone who, who had quite a distressing time trying with it. Which of those was, which of those records hasn't been attempted? A, continuous massaging. B, crying non-stop for seven days, or C, the longest time reading aloud. Which of those hasn't been attempted? Lots of you saying crying non-stop for seven days, because I think you possibly saw something in the news that related to that. 
Sadly, you're wrong. It's, the answer is C. The longest time reading aloud has not been tried because the, the image that I saw this week is probably the one you're thinking of is the chap who tried to cry non-stop for seven days and, and, and feared he'd gone blind. <sighs> Who's on six? Is anyone on six as we enter the final straight? The, well, not the final straight, the final bend, not the final bend, the final piece of concrete. Oh, that's so nice. How many hours into a continuous massage does it become just painful, says Elmick. That's a really good point. Because let's face it, it's only enjoyable for the first minute. Uh, oh, look, Nessie Jeff has got five. Anyone got six, four? Yeah, see, five. I think five is a goodie. So if you get six, Nessie Jeff, you're doing good. Um, what are you drinking? Barocca and tequila. It's, it's a cracking way to just open the account. Uh, question seven. An Australian fisherman and his dog were rescued after two months at sea, surviving on raw fish. That's my ideal diet, that. But where were they eventually found? A, almost 2,000 miles off the coast of Western Australia. B, an isolated atoll in the Marshall Islands. Or C, drifting off the coast of Mexico. And boy, his eyes have gone so blue. I do wonder sometimes if people with blue eyes, their eyes go bluer if they just look at the sea. So where was he found? A, 2,000 miles off the coast of Western Australia. B, an isolated atoll in the Marshall Islands. Or C, drifting off the coast of Mexico. Drifting off the coast of Mexico. Drinking Barocca and tequila. Uh, it was drifting off the coast of Mexico. Yeah, he survived on sushi. Wow, what a diet. Much better than an almond a day, Killian. I know someone whose eyes look bluer if they are ill, says Teresa Hutchinson. Wow. I love blue eyes, but then sometimes blue eyes can seem the coldest, right? I remember I used to look up at my mum when I was a boy and I'd think, she's not human, she's an alien, because her eyes were so blue. They almost repel you. Whereas brown eyes, kind of, you sort of drop into, don't you? You fall into them. Almost. It's not a judgment, but I'm just saying, I just find blue eyes sometimes, are, they're, they're, they're astonishing, but at the same time, they can sort of, wow. There you go, guys. Um, I can see that none of you are winners. You're all losers, which is fine. Have a lovely day. Lots, lots landing. Curly Cooks tomorrow. Uh, the Coffee Moaning um, newspapers. The No Name Sunday show is coming on, on Sunday. And something will be landing tonight, too. So have